Thank you and uh, enjoy the discussion. After a couple of months hiatus, I decided that we would get back into the book of Acts. And really, this section of the book of Acts that we are going to be getting involved in, it represents kind of a shift in perspective. The first part of Acts was mostly about the... Well, mostly followed the travels of Peter. There were some references to Philip and Stephen and the apostles to Paul. But from Acts chapter 13 onwards, we are going to be looking primarily at the life of Paul and the things that he did. Good things, bad things, and so on. Uh, well, that was a slight joke. Well, there aren't really a lot of bad things that Paul does in this particular story. But in Acts chapter 13 is where we're going to be picking up in uh, this morning's lesson as we look at what is sometimes called the first missionary journey. Uh, it's kind of hard to refer to some of these as missionary journeys because the Bible doesn't really call them that. That's, something, that's a title that men came up with to try to explain it better and to draw the uh, routes in our Bible atlases and the backs of our Bibles. And it's probably some of the most ge geographically detailed of travels in the scriptures, which makes it so easy to trace on the map. Of course, if you, what we call Paul's third missionary journey is only a journey in the sense that Paul goes to Ephesus and lives there for three years. So if you consider that journeying, uh, well, that, that, that's a very different kind of journeying, I might say. It's more like a change of residence at that point. But primarily what we're looking at is Paul's journeys in uh, Cyprus and Antioch in chapter 13 and throughout much of Galatia as well in chapter 14. The first missionary journey is where Paul set up the churches in the Galatian region, which later had the letter of Galatians written to them. I want to remind us briefly about how the outline of Acts is really about the spread of the gospel as a whole. And this outline I showed in previous lessons, but since it's been a while, I'm putting it up again. The gospel is starts in Jerusalem, and then when persecution begins, the gospel spreads to Samaria and Judea, per the instructions of Jude, Jesus. Uh, chapter 9, 32 through 12, 25 details the third section about how the gospel is first given to Gentiles through the conversion of Cornelius and a few other elements in that story as well. It culminates in the imprisonment of Peter and his movement out of the Judean region. In this new section that we are beginning from chapter 13 onwards, we're going to see how the gospel is brought further to the uncircumcised people. And, well, what's the difference between that and the gospel among the Gentiles, you might be asking? Well, mainly the fact that in this section, the issue of circumcision comes up and the central question that is, the apostles have to confront as a result of Paul's travels in this region is, does somebody have to be circumcised according to the law and become a Jew before they can become a Christian? And that story is told basically in two parts. First, Paul's actual journey around Galatia, setting up those churches. And second, what we call the, sometimes referred to as the Jerusalem Council, basically where the apostles and elders get together and confront the issue head on, and the Spirit gives his word that it is not necessary to become a Jew to become a Christian. The gospel is something that is for all and is not limited to any ethnic group or nation. The gospel spreads to Europe in the, next, in the subsequent section and then into Roman courts. Paul spends the bulk of chapters 19 through 28 in prison or moving through from prison to prison while he is on trial before the Roman authorities. So we're going to look at that as we go. The shift, of course, in chapter 13 is from focus on Peter to focus on Paul. But there's a lot of things that those two men have in common. And so, I realize that, you know, we're kind of... I don't know why it's italicized up here, but it is. I realize that since we're kind of shifting from uh, a couple of months of not talking about Acts, there's a lot of room for review, and we're not going to spend the whole lesson reviewing because that wouldn't really be right. And I realize also that this chart probably uh, is making some people squint because of the font size. I apologize for that. But basically what's going on is Peter had a series of events that he went through in the first 12 chapters, and Paul goes through some very similar events, showing that he is an apostle 
in like fashion to Peter. For instance, both of them preach a lengthy sermon that uses Psalm 16 to prove the resurrection of the dead. Peter did that in Acts chapter 2. Paul's going to do that at Antioch in Acts chapter 13. Both of them heal a lame man early on in their described work. Peter, heals, Peter and John heal a lame man in Acts chapter 3. Paul heal, and Barnabas heal a lame man in Acts chapter 14. Uh, in Acts chapter 5, Peter, Peter's reputation for the miraculous was so much that people were just begging to be in his shadow, that his shadow might fall on them and they might be healed. In Acts chapter 19, Paul's reputation for healing becomes so much that he, he has uh, even handkerchiefs are carried from him to people who need healing and they are healed. Uh, both of them have an incident involving laying on of hands, Peter at Samaria in Acts chapter 8, and Paul at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Both of them have a confrontation with a magician or a sorcerer. In Peter's case, it was Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, and in Paul's case, it was Elymas or Bargesus the sorcerer in Acts chapter 13, which we will look at this morning. Both of them have an instance where somebody died and they had to raise them from the dead. There's only two instances of resurrection in the book of Acts. Tabitha in chapter 9, whom Peter raised, and Eutychus in chapter 20, whom Paul raised. Peter is wrongfully worshipped in chapter 10 and has to stop Cornelius from worshipping him. Paul and Barnabas are wrongfully worshipped in chapter 14 and they have to stop the, the folks in Lystra from worshipping them. Both of them have to deal with controversy over, I don't know why it cut that out there, but controversy over preaching to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. Peter in Acts chapter 11, Paul in Acts chapter 15. And both of them wind up in prison facing death at the end of their respective narratives. Of course, Peter gets out of prison in Acts chapter 12, and Paul, while his release from prison is not documented, um, history tells us that Paul did in fact survive his first Roman imprisonment in Acts chapter 28. It was his second Roman imprisonment during which he wrote 2 Timothy where he was eventually put to death. So that's just kind of an interesting comparison. I, I thought it was interesting anyway. But it shows something that, you know, it's not just Peter who has the so-called primacy. Peter's not the only person in the story that's important. And it shows that the Spirit can work through anybody. It can, even, it can work through Peter who has a reputation for being impulsive. They can work through Paul, who was the foremost of sinners and who was the persecutor. He becomes like an, he becomes an apostle himself. But this book really isn't Acts of the Apostles. It's Acts of the Holy Spirit. It shows how the Spirit was using people to make the early believers community grow. And that is where we're now going to turn our attention. In Acts chapter 13. We're going to look at their Galilean... Well, no, excuse me, not their Galilean. Their Galatian journey... Wrong place name that starts with G. They are commissioned by the Spirit. In Cyprus, they meet Elymas the magician. In Antioch, they have a sermon that they give to the Jewish synagogue, and then they try to convert Greeks, and, well, it's the attempt to preach to the Gentiles that turns the Jewish community on them. The Gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek, we see in Antioch. In Iconium, they are met with resistance. In Lystra... They, have a, they perform a miracle which provokes pagan worship until the folks from Antioch and Iconium show up and try to kill them. The journey is concluded and with the remark that through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 14. And the Spirit's commission is considered complete when they return to the Antioch of Syria and deliver a report. So that's kind of the basic flow of that journey. We'll keep that in mind as we go through. Let's start by reading about their commission in chapter 13. There were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, the first thing I would note about what's going on here is that there are already numerous teachers at Antioch. Barnabas, Simon Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. Some people think that that's the Luke who wrote this book. I don't know. Uh, Menaean, the childhood companion of Herod, and Saul. Now, these names here, references uh, to Niger and Cyrene, 
and a companion of Herod, suggest an ethnic diversity within this group of early disciples. But what's fascinating to me about all of this is how many preachers does this congregation at Antioch feel the need to have? Five! Most congregations today try to get by with one. It is extremely rare, and in fact, it's, I think, difficult to even produce an example where a congregation functioned under the uh, work of a single teacher or evangelist. Now, imagine how congregations could thrive today if they had five full-time workers for the gospel. Now, of course, the naysayers will say there's no budget for it. I wonder where they got it in the first century when they were far comparatively poorer to us. The Spirit decides that, of course, they need to share some of these guys that they have. They are so prolific and so profitable, so he picks out two of them, Saul and Barnabas, to set them apart for the work. The early disciples were fasting and praying as part of their regular work. Kind of interesting, one of the several references we're going to see in the book of Acts to fasting. There's actually more time... There's actually more evidence for fasting among early Christians than there is for first day Lord's Supper observance. Think about that for a minute. The Spirit decides that it's time for Saul and Barnabas to go do work in Asia Minor. I want to spread the gospel further. Antioch is thriving. Let's go put the gospel somewhere else now. And so the congregation's response is prayer and fasting. They... They pray and they fast as part of their serious task of commending the disciples to their evangelistic work. They lay hands on Saul and Barnabas as a way of commissioning them to that work. And then they are sent out to preach. That is what early churches did. They had so many teachers and they had such an overflowing, overflowing abundance of teaching of the gospel that they were able to thrive and they were able to grow and they were able to send out workers to go somewhere else, too. That should be the goal of every local congregation. That should be the goal here, too, for that matter, by the way. But it doesn't happen with just one person. You see, the congregation at Antioch needed five teachers to get it done. It's rare to see that in churches today, I'm sad to say. Something to think about. Well, their journey proceeds to Cyprus, verses 4 through 12, being sent out... By the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there sailed, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Alamus the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. The proconsul believed when he saw what had happened being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. In verse 3 it says the congregation sent them. In verse 4 it says that the Spirit sent them. What happens is Saul and Barnabas sail to Cyprus. Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 200 miles journey from the Mediterranean to Antioch. Uh, and it is, incidentally, the home island of Barnabas, as we learn from chapter 4 and verse 36. They also, it's not just Saul and Barnabas traveling, they have John Mark with them as well. We've seen John Mark before, actually, it was uh, his home in which, uh, in which the people praying for Peter were meeting in uh, chapter 12 in verse 12. And we see also in verse 25 that Barnabas and Saul had brought John Mark with them from Jerusalem after fulfilling their mission to give benevolent aids to the local churches. John Mark is frequently associated with the Gospel of Mark. Um, of course, who wrote the Gospels? In truth, we don't know. The names handed down to us are tradition, and there's no real reason to doubt them. Uh, 
But what's going on here, and John Mark is acting as their helper, their assistant. Of course, he doesn't stick with them once they get to Asia Minor. He departs, and that causes a whole falling out between Paul and Barnabas. We'll see that later. Hmm. When they get to Cyprus, they begin preaching in the Jewish synagogues. They start in Salamis, which was at the eastern end of the island. And they go to Paphos, at the western end of the island. That's about a 115 to 145 mile journey, uh, depending on what roads they took. But they go from one end of the island to the other, and they visit all these... They might have visited cities in between, we don't know. But they, they cover the whole island on this first journey. We don't know how long that took them. We don't know how long they were there. Luke instead chooses to focus on the two people they meet at Paphos. Two contrasting characters. Sergius Paulus and Bar-Jesus, who is also called Elymas. Uh, the name Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus. And no, he's not the actual son of Jesus. Jesus was a very common name in the ancient world. It was the same word in Greek as the name Joshua. Um, he is, but there's also Sergius Paulus, which uh, translation obscures the fact that Paulus and Paul are actually exactly the same spelling in Greek. It was Sergius Paul. Which is why Luke maybe clarifies Saul, who was also called Paul, because there's two guys in the story named Paul, Sergius Paul and just Paul. According to archaeology, Sergius Paulus was the appointed curator in Rome in 47 AD. And since Paul's journey to Cyprus predates that by several years, uh, it seems like he was the proconsul here during that time. In this is also, incidentally, the first story where Saul is identified as Paul. Sergius Paul wants to hear the word of God, but Elymas does not want him preaching. So, Saul condemns Elymas. Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all unrighteousness, will you not seek to make, cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now that is pretty insulting. Now what do we do with that? How do we respond to false teachers? So well, this is how Paul chooses to respond to them. Son of the devil. You know, it's kind of interesting the way names are played with in this text, of course. Uh, this is the first place where Saul is identified as Paul, as I mentioned before. There's a popular belief that goes around that, you know, Saul changed his name when he got baptized, which isn't really true because he's called Saul numerous times after his baptism. Uh, more likely, he had two names, like most people in the Bible had two names, because he was conversant in two languages. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of people in the book of Acts that have two names, like John, who was called Mark, uh, Joseph, who was called Barnabas, Bar-Jesus himself, who was called Elymas, and Simon, who was called Peter, and Nathaniel, who was called Bartholomew, and Judas, who was called Thaddeus, etc., etc., etc. A lot of people in the Bible have multiple names, and Saul is just another one. And from the point, the further westward he goes, now he's more commonly referred to as Paul. Well, let's just keep that in mind. Paul is filled with the Spirit, and he insults Elymas. Because Elymas is not filled with the Spirit, but filled with dis deceit. He is not a son of Jesus at all, but rather a son of the devil. He is not a friend of the proconsul, but rather an enemy of righteousness. He is taking the straight ways of God and making them crooked, even though the Lord had said that He would make every road straight and make a highway in the wilderness. Now, is it wrong, is it always wrong to say things like this about people? Is it, wrong, is it always wrong to call someone full of deceit and fraud and a son of the devil and an enemy of, of righteousness? Well, clearly, it's not always wrong to call them that because Paul called somebody that while he was full of the Spirit. The Spirit is saying these things. When someone is full of deceit and they are opposing true teaching, we have an obligation to call it what it is, to call it deceptive. May God help us to find boldness. You know what Paul doesn't do? He doesn't gossip about Elymas. He doesn't go get in the car with Barnabas on the ride home and go, boy, that Bar Jesus, you see how he acted this morning? I can't believe he said those things. That's not what Paul did. He talked it, he said it to his face. That you are full of deceit. You are opposing the truth. You are crook-looking the straight ways of the Lord. 
Paul doesn't go home and write an article about Elymas and publish it in some magazine. He tells him this stuff to his face because that is how you're supposed to deal with false teachers. Well, it's not just the response that's insulting. It's backed up by the judgment of God. Elymas is struck with blindness. He can no longer see the sun. As Paul was once struck with blindness, now this false teacher is struck with blindness too. As far as the narrative is concerned, this silences him. Elymas no longer says anything in the story. He's just forced to grope around. By contrast, the proconsul's converted. He believes and he is amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So let's ask ourselves one very simple question. Can truth triumph over error? Absolutely it can. You know, the solution to this story is ultimately to, re to refute what false teaching is being said so that it is no longer able to, well, to pronounce a voice for itself. Here we have the conversion of Sergius Paulus. Uh, Baptism is not mentioned in this conversion story, interestingly. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But it does throw a wrinkle in the argument that people make that baptism is mentioned in every conversion story in Acts. So, you don't count Sergius Paulus or others. Uh, let's continue. Antioch, there's a rather lengthy description of what happens at Antioch. Most of it taken up by a speech that Paul gives. Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials said to them, was sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. And Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, and then he proceeded to relate the sermon here. I'll just kind of note a couple things before we get into this. Uh, first of all, uh, they make harbor at Perga. John Mark decides to leave them. That later makes a, creates a little tension between Paul and Barnabas. We're going to see. They leave Perga and they travel to Antioch. Well, that's a different Antioch than where they started. There's actually two cities called Antioch in the New Testament. One of them is the Syrian Antioch that is in the region of Palestine and Syria and that area. And the other Antioch is up in Asia Minor, in Pisidia. It's where these Galatian churches get started. Well, at the end of the regular synagogue service, the leaders open up the floor for a word of exhortation. Imagine if all church worked that way, you know? We get done with the service, we get done with everything, and we get to the end and say, does anybody else want to give a sermon? I imagine that way of thinking probably wouldn't be very popular in some churches because people want to get to lunch, but that's what they did in the Jewish synagogues. They knew that Paul was there, he apparently had a reputation, uh, he was a rabbi under the tutelage of Gamaliel as far as they knew, so he's able to so freely insert himself into the synagogue. They want to hear from Paul. It shows something about how Jewish Paul really is and about how he uses his Jewish identity as grounds to exhort those who have not yet recognized Jesus as Messiah. But at the same time, Paul didn't allow his Jewish identity to limit who he preached to. There's a key there. As opposed to, you know, where some people... It, it's kind of interesting, you know. I mean, would it be appropriate to go into the assemblies of others and exhort them in this fashion... Yeah, it's biblical precedent. That's what Paul does. Yet most people on Sunday mornings are kind of content to stay in their own church box and well, worship the Lord in that sense. Well, perhaps there's something to be said for getting out of our comfort zone and proclaiming the gospel to others. Just a thought. Paul's sermon relates a lot of history. I'll give the sermon here. Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. They asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to a promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, 
after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, some of Abraham's fam well, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. For many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, in that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. And that's how the sermon ends right there. Um, again, we don't know if we're just getting the cliff notes or not. The bulk of the sermon is uh, very similar to Peter's sermon in Acts 2, especially in its usage of the 16th Psalm. He tells us the history from Exodus to John the Baptist. God chose the fathers of Israel. He multiplied the people in Egypt. He put up with them in the wilderness for 40 years. He destroyed seven nations of Canaan and distributed an inheritance to them. We just went through Exodus through Joshua and like 10 seconds. That's better than we did in our class quarters, I guess. Uh, but Paul's giving us the cliff note survey here. Uh, he gave them judges until Samuel, this summarizes the book of Judges, that was pretty fast. People asked Samuel for a king and God gave them Saul. Perhaps here's the reason why Saul decides to be known as Paul, so that he's no longer associated with this bad king here. Affirming the Old Testament testimony that God is the one that chose Saul as king, Saul reigned for 40 years. That's the only time in the Bible that we're told how long Saul reigned, actually, because the number's missing if you read Samuel. After he removed Saul, he chose David as king in his place. A combination quote of Psalm 89, I have found David a man after my own heart. 1 Samuel, Samuel 13, 14. David's the key figure in the story. Because apart from him, well, because from him, God brings a Savior to Israel, Jesus. And then he jumps to John the Baptist. John proclaimed a repentance, the immersion of repentance to all Israel. Um, the goal here, of course, is the salvation of Israel. But it becomes clear in the New Testament that Israel means more than just ethnic Israel. Paul's sermon seems to assume that they know who John the Baptist was. We find out later that John's teaching had actually expanded all the way to places like Alexandria and Ephesus. There were people there baptized with the baptism of John. We think of John as a guy that lived in the wilderness and uh, all by himself, but that doesn't mean he didn't have influence. People went out to see him and be baptized by him. Paul appeals to John's proclamation in verse 24 and 25. That John, he, he had not, he's not the predicted son of David. He's not the predicted servant of the Lord. There's one coming after him. Who's, who, the sandals of whose feet he is not worthy to untie. Paul says, now let me tell you about that man. Jesus. That message of salvation sent to us. This is the witness he gives of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The men of Israel, the sons of Abraham's family, he says these phrases in verses 16 and 26 to kind of stir up feelings of Jewish nationalism. But before the chapter ends, that's going to get turned on its head. The rulers in Jerusalem, they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't recognize the scriptures that were read every Sabbath among them. 
And if the rulers of this age had understood God's wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. They demanded his execution from Pilate, even though Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. I find it interesting to note in passing that unlike what was going on in Jerusalem, Paul doesn't throw out the line, you know, you killed Jesus, you killed Jesus. That, that way of evangelizing is absent outside of the preaching in Jerusalem where they actually killed Jesus. Kind of interesting. Um, but the problem, of course, is that they didn't recognize what was going on in their Bibles. Here we are in the synagogue. The scriptures have just been read. Paul says, think about your scriptures for a minute. Because they were telling you about this all along. That it was necessary for the Lord's Christ to suffer, to be raised from the dead on the third day. But no, they took Jesus down from the cross. They laid him in the tomb. They carried out all that was written concerning him in verse 29. They didn't recognize the fulfillment of their own Bibles. But verse 30, verse 30 is the gospel in a nutshell. God raised him from the dead. And from that statement, everything changes. Subsequently, Jesus appeared to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The same people who now witnessed to his resurrection. And now Paul is proclaiming that same message, that same good news of promise, as he himself is an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. And Jesus... He's really the fulfillment of every promise made to Abraham and to David and to everybody else. There were some examples given of scriptures in verses 33 through 37. Quoting from Psalm 2 in verse 7, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's the only place in the Bible, by the way, where uh, one of the apostles uses an actual chapter number because he refers to it as the second psalm. The installment of God's Messiah as king means he can't be defeated or destroyed. And if he is destroyed, this text demands his resurrection. A resurrection is an event where Jesus is declared the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness. He is no longer to return to decay in fulfillment of Isaiah 55 and verse 3. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. There's a whole sermon on how Paul's using that text. But one thing I would note in passing is that he says is that the you is plural here. I will give you all the holy and sure blessings of David. Resurrection is not just for Jesus. It's for everybody else, too, who follows in the footsteps of Jesus. And third, he uses Psalm 16, a basic psalm of trust. The logic of the psalm is because David has taken refuge in God, he trusts God not to abandon him into the realm of the dead. Well, the only problem with that is that David's dead. And so was his trust for nothing? Was it in vain? Well, as Peter pointed out in the first sermon... David's confidence was not misplaced. He looked ahead. He saw that his words demanded something greater. And the greater thing that his words demanded was the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the message of the gospel is. This life is not all there is to this life. Death is not the end. Resurrection can be yours if you repent of your sins. That's the catch. The words of the psalm demand more than David's life. And that brings us, of course, to the third thing, the warning to repent. Because the gospel comes with a warning. The resurrection of Jesus isn't just a historical event for us to think about and reflect on. It has implications for how we live. It is something for us to act on as well. Through Jesus, it says, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, verse 38. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from the things which you could not be freed from through the law of Moses. Jesus did what the law could not do. This is the first time in Acts, by the way, that people have openly criticized the law. But it won't be the last. And even though Paul teaches that the law was inadequate to save... The prophets are still sufficient to condemn. He quotes here from Habakkuk 1 and verse 5. Behold, you scoffers, marvel and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Now, if you know the story of Habakkuk, and you know Habakkuk was talking, but he was, Habakkuk is basically a conversation between the prophet and God. Habakkuk laments the wickedness of the people and how terrible the situation is, how horrible and messed up of a society we live in. And God says, Habakkuk, don't worry. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send the Chaldeans to obliterate you. Habakkuk goes, well, that's even worse. The Chaldeans are worse than we are. What are you letting them win for, Lord? 
and on and on the conversation goes. But Habakkuk 1 and verse 5, which is quoted here, is the way that God describes this. I am accomplishing something in your days that is so shocking that no one will have seen it coming. So this is the odd dilemma. God will use pagans who are more wicked than these Jews to judge them. Paul reapplies this quote to a new historical situation. One in which those who are listening in the synagogue will face potential retribution for their failure to recognize what is going on. For an unwillingness to acknowledge their sin. There is no one who does not sin and there is no one who is perfect. There is no one who is not in need of repentance. But more than that, this quote kind of hints at what's going to happen next. Because in Habakkuk, the Jews were overrun by people that were more godless than they were. Chaldeans. Gentiles. And it is, this chapter will not even be over before the same thing happens again. And before they judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. And Paul says, now we're going to the Gentiles with this message as well. And all because they will, not, they will never believe the work, though someone should describe it to you. But here's the thing about all of this. They actually initially get a good reception in verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. People like the gospel initially. It's what happens in the subsequent verses that things start to unravel. Now we're not going to read those verses and we're not going to comment on them more extensively because we are low on time this morning. We'll look into more into the persecution response next time. Let's bring it home a little bit for a minute. Let's ask ourselves a question. Is there anything that God has said that we don't believe it even after it's described to us? Now, I purposefully said a couple things in this sermon that were a little unusual because they're different from the way we do things, like the idea of having five preachers, or the idea of fasting, or other things like that. That's in the Bible. You can't deny that that's in the Bible. The question I have for every one of us, and the question I have for myself included in that, is that how do you respond to this information? When we say, well, our ancestors figured everything out a hundred years ago and we don't need to change a thing. We're perfect the way we are. We have the name Church of Christ on that sign and that makes us the best people in the world, so just don't argue with that. Is that what we think? That idea, that attitude is so godless and arrogant, I don't even know where to begin with it. That, that is perverting the crooked ways of the Lord. If we're going to approach the Scriptures... It doesn't come with an attitude of dismissal. Now we can examine what the scripture says and we can talk about things and we can have conversation about these things and whatnot. But never think for a second that humans attained perfection while God was absent on the scene. Our endeavor should be to do what the Bible says and do what the Lord has said. And if we see something in our practices that doesn't line up with what the scripture has said, we are the ones to change, not God. That is our attitude toward that it should be our attitude towards biblical authority. The way people did it in the past is not authority. The way your parents did it is not authority. The way your favorite preacher does it is not authority. And what I say is not authority either. What the word of God says is the authority. The final standard. The only standard and the words by which we must live. So let's ask ourselves that question. Do we believe things simply because... Well, do, do we refuse to believe things even though they are described to us by the Lord? Let's not be like those who rejected the message of truth. But rather, let us be those who are pricked to the hearts and change, conform our lives to the Word of God. That's the lesson. Of course, there are other ways in which people have resist the gospel as well. You know, one area, of course, is the need for one's salvation and bringing, making oneself right with the Lord. I look behind me. The baptistry is full this morning. It wasn't full when we came in. We've, uh, we've 
For the first time in a long time, we have water in the baptistry. And perhaps that's a time as good as any to think about it. You know, that if you're here this morning and you're not baptized, if you've not been immersed into the Lord Jesus, or perhaps you've been looking at your life and you realize that my life ain't right with the Lord. Maybe I wasn't, maybe I didn't know what I was doing the first time. Maybe I uh, just got wet. Whatever the case may be, if the Word of God has convicted you, don't fear to act on it. Don't be afraid of what other people think. Hear what the Lord thinks. Care about what the Lord thinks. And make your life right with Him. If there's anything 